wanted to introduce now uh, Barbara Carlin, who is the author of And the Wolves Howl, and uh, Barbara is also a champion equestrian. Uh, Barbara was also the reincarnation of Anne Frank, and, um, and she obviously is the author of the diary of Anne Frank, which is the second most read document in the world next to the Bible. Uh, Barbara, can you tell us a little bit about your, your book and the wolves howl and your story? Yes, I will. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for having me here. I'm very happy to come here, and uh, thank you, Walter, for inviting me. I will start to read just a few lines from my book just to get us started. And it's called Memories from the Past. The darkness closes tighter and tighter around her. She's weeping and afraid. Her little body is shaking and she's drenched in sweat. She can hear them running up the stairs. The shouted orders piece her body like knives. Dogs are barking and with a crash the door is kicked in. She wakes up. It's almost light outside. The birds are singing and everything is quiet. Still not quite out of her dream, she dries away the tears from her face. So this is about what my childhood was like most of the time. I had these horrible dreams for as long as I can remember. And when I was about two years old, I told my mother that my name was not really Barbro, it was Anne. And uh, of course my mother didn't know what to say and she didn't really understand it, I guess. So she, she just thought that I had a very lively fantasy. And uh, I kept having my dreams and I tried to find out how strange it was that I was living in two worlds at the same time. I know my name was Anna Frank, but they insist calling me on Barbro. And my parents insisted me to call them mom and pa, and I knew they were not my real parents. So it was a very difficult situation to grow up like this, because I had no one to talk to. And even though my parents were very, very loving and caring, they didn't want to deal with this. So they just pushed me down when I talked about it. So the years went past and I kept telling them that my name was Anne and that my father was soon going to come and get me and I was going to leave them. And my mother got so worried, so she finally she took me to a psychiatrist because she thought I was crazy. And uh, at that time, I was about six years old at that time. So I have found out that it was not really a good thing to talk about because everybody got so tense when I, when I tried to explain to them what I experienced. So I realized that this doctor that was supposed to talk to me uh, would be like any other adult and, and just make me feel bad about it. So I didn't tell him anything about it. I was just like a normal six-year-old happy girl. And he said to my mother that she's as normal as she can be. So don't worry about it. She will grow out of it. Well, I never did. I had my memories with me, and I just became more and more quiet about it. But then when I was seven and I started school, I learned how to read and how to write. And that was a wonderful, wonderful relief because now I could write and I could tell the paper everything that I couldn't tell anyone else because I, when I wrote it, I could throw it away, which I did. Most of it I threw away right away. But a lot of pieces of paper were spread around in my room and uh, it was everything from poetry to little stories, thoughts about uh, the higher power, reincarnation, where we came from, where we were going. And uh, one day, a friend of the family found all these pieces of papers laying around everywhere. And he read it and he gathered it and he asked 
my parents if he may take it and show it to a publisher and they said by all means we don't care we she had done that for so many years so we we didn't even think about it at that time I was about 11 years old so he gathered everything he could find and asked me for more and I just gave him what I had and before I knew it my first book was published called Man on Earth and uh, that was published when I was 12 and uh, it kind of went off, took off from there because I was so young and there was a lot of publicity around it but nothing that I had memories from being Anna Frank or anything because I had decided not to talk about it anymore. I was not to say ashamed but I was feeling really awkward because uh, in school I realized that Anna Frank was a famous person and the first time I heard about that I was I was shocked actually because all of a sudden my teacher started to talk about Anna Frank and here I was knowing that I was Anna Frank and how can she talk about me how, how it didn't really work for me and then eventually of course uh, she told about the diary and about everything so I realized pretty soon that it was not very smart to go around and say that I had been Anna Frank so I just became very quiet about it also when I was 10 years old, I go back a little bit in time here, when I was 10 years old my parents decided to take me and themselves for a trip around Europe to see the big cities, London, Paris, Amsterdam, Berlin and uh, we went for, on our trip and eventually we came to Amsterdam. We stayed in a hotel and my parents wanted to see of course everything that was worth seeing in Amsterdam and Anna Frank's house was one of it and uh, I guess at that time they had just said that my, my talk about Anna Frank and everything was fantasies and they had just dismissed it more or less and uh, we were at the hotel room and my father said that let's do the Anna Frank house first so I called for a cab and I found myself saying to them we don't need a cab we're not far away and I knew exactly where we were and he said how, how can you say that you've never been here before I said well I don't know but I, let me show you the way I know it's not far so they said okay so they walked with me and I took them there and we walked for maybe 10 minutes and it was a little bit crisscross in the streets and when we came I said it's around the next corner and we will be there and we were and, and of course both my parents they were like what is happening here but they didn't say much and then when we came up towards the house I saw that the steps outside were different were changed so I stopped and I said it's strange they have changed those steps and still my parents didn't say anything and we went in paid our tickets and when I came into that house it was the most horrifying feeling I have ever had because all of a sudden I was back to my dreams I recognized everything I had seen ever since I was a little child and uh, I took my mother's hand and when she felt how cold I was and, and sweaty I was she said my god what, what's the matter with you don't you want to go in here and I said yes I want to go just want to hold your hand we walked up those stairs and we came up to the room where Anna Frank had lived and I was absolutely terrified but there was a part of me that, that wanted to, to see it and I guess to, to see if I remember the right if I had the right pictures and if everything was the same way that I, that I knew it should be so when I looked at one of the walls I saw all these pictures from newspaper magazines that was cut out and it was from movie stars and song stars and things and it made me feel almost happy because I, I said like I said to my mother look the pictures are still there and it was like almost coming home and she said what pictures and she looked on the wall and I looked on the wall and there were no pictures there 
I said, what do you mean? What are you talking about? I said, I saw those pictures on the wall, and I know they have been there. So she said, wait a minute. So she walked over to, to one of the guys that worked there and said, tell me, has, has it ever been pictures on, on this wall? And the guy said, yes, we just took them down a couple of weeks ago because Anna Frank put them up there, but we put them, t- took them down because people are taking them and they're touching them and they will all be destroyed. But now we're putting them in a frame and glass so no one can, can destroy them, but they will be up again. And I think that was the moment where my mother realized that it was not fantasy. Something happened, had happened, that, that was bigger than she could understand. So uh, she, she just you know, hugged me and, and said, I understand, and uh, you're not alone anymore. So I asked her if I could leave because I just couldn't be there anymore. And of course, my father, he was interested in seeing all the documentary papers and everything that was there. So they wanted to stay. And I promised them that I will just go outside and I will wait for you outside. So they let me go. And uh, I walked down those stairs. And I was crying, I tell you. (laughs) I was crying. And I was so scared. It was terrible. I walked down, and then when I was almost down, I see this man in a green uniform coming up behind me and hitting his hand, arm over me. And I swear to you, he was so real like you are to me now. I know he was there. So I tried to shelter myself. I fell, and I fell down on the floor, and I was laying there. And when I looked up, I saw all these tourists standing there looking at me. And uh, there was, of course, no, no man in a green uniform. So uh, I stumbled out, and uh, I waited outside for my parents, and they finally came out. And like I said, at that time, my mother realized that, that I actually had been Anna Frank and that I had lived before. She totally accepted it. And from that day on, she became very spiritual herself. My father was a little bit different because he was almost annoyed that he had been overproved that I had lived before. He didn't want to be overproved. He, he just wanted to live in his Christian world where everything was set right. So he said that, well, I can't understand how you could show us the way here, how you could see the steps and how you could see the pictures and everything. And I admit that you have probably been here one way or another before, but that's it. You are the only one, and I don't ever want to talk about this again. So, and that was fine with me because I, I got the support from my mother, and I finally felt like I had been there, and I had dealt with it, and I hoped that I could put it behind me because I really didn't want to, to deal with it. I didn't want to talk about it anymore. So I kept on writing my books, and that was my way of letting it out. But I didn't have any need whatsoever to tell people that I knew I had been Anna Frank, or that I had memories, or whatever. And I actually never thought I would. If someone had said to me just, six, seven years ago, that you will go out and speak in public and even write a book about you have being Anna Frank. And I would said, never. That would never happen. But you see, you should never say never. <laughs> so I will tell later why, why everything changed. But as I grew up, when I was about 15, my memory slowly started to fade away. And I was so relieved. It was like getting a new life. All of a sudden, I started to become Barbro more and more. I could enjoy my friends, my my riding. I was riding horses, and I wrote wrote my books. And these memories just came further and further away from me. When I was about 16 and 17, I never had any bad dreams. I really didn't have any memories at all. I just remembered that I have had memories but I didn't have to deal with it at all. So uh, I, was, I was actually very, very happy. And I thought everything was behind me. 
boy, was I wrong, I tell you. When I was 18, I got married, a very short marriage, and I had a son that was born when I was 19. And uh, I, me and my son was alone, uh, and I raised him by myself together with my mother more or less helped me. Because when I was about 23, I realized I couldn't make a living out of writing books and supporting my son and myself and everything. And I felt it was kind of not responsible to just rely on people wanting to buy what I wrote. At that time, I had written about 10 books that was published. And they sold, and they were, they were translated into different languages and everything, but still, it was not responsible not to have an education where I could have a proper profession. So I thought, what, what, I sh what should I do and what can I, what can I become? What can become out of me? And my choice may seem very strange, but growing up, and even when I was older, even though I didn't have my memories left, I still had very difficult moments with certain things. And among those things was uniforms. Police, police in uniforms it was always terrifying. So when I was pulled over by a police car, asked to, to show my driver's license, that was like someone was going to kill me. I mean, it was so terrible. And more than once, I was thinking about trying to get away from them, which I never did, luckily. But I think if I hadn't done anything to that, so-called phobia, I would have been in real trouble sooner or later. So, and also I was riding horses, and as everybody knows, that's a very expensive sport to have, very expensive uh, interest. So I put these two things together, and I said to myself, why not become a mounted police officer? Then I can ride and get paid for it, and I put myself in a uniform, and maybe I can be normal and accept that uniforms are not killing machines. So I did, I went to the police academy in Stockholm because I'm born in Sweden, as, as you might know. And I went there for one year. And I went through all the deals with the law books and driving and whatever you have to do as becoming a police officer. And after three years of education, I came into the mounted police in Gothenburg on the west coast of Sweden. And I started to work as a mounted police officer training the young horses, which was wonderful. I loved it. And uh, I did that actually for 15 years. And uh, that was a long time, especially when you consider that things started to happen in the mounted police force that actually led to, to this book and led to everything coming back to me, which is very strange. I had often wondered why did I remember my past life? Why, why do I have these memories and why don't you have them? Or my mother had them, or why, why was I different? And I never figured it out. I thought it was kind of unfair almost because it, it, it made my childhood so difficult. And also when I wrote my books, I. I grew up not as a normal child because of the books made so much publicity. So I was supposed to give speeches and read from my books and priest and this and that wanted to discuss with me. And I was not really allowed to be a child. So I thought it was kind of unfair. And I was wondering why. And I was soon to get the answer. There was especially one man at the police force that I was really, I was terrified of him when I heard his voice. And when he talked to me, I mean, it was like terrible, terrible experience. And this went on and on and it just escalated. And the event that happened, it's all described in my book and it's a very long story. I can't do it because then we will not leave here tonight. So I will just tell you that he, together with another person, started kind of a prosecution against me 
and a crusade against me for no reason whatsoever, not at least what I, I could figure out at that time. And it just got worse and worse and worse. So finally I found myself living in that nightmare that I have had almost as a child. I had it in my life. Of course they didn't come barging into my house and with, with uh, dogs and, and but this, this crusade against me and this prosecution against me was so determined and it was so strong, I couldn't get away from it. No way I could get away from it. And after a very short while, my memories came back. My, my dreams came back, like the dreams I had when I was a child. All of a sudden. So I found myself having nightmares in the day and nightmares in the night. And there was no relief to be found anywhere. And it was driving me crazy. This went on for more than a year. And uh, I didn't know what to do. There were no answer for me why this was happening. I couldn't see the connection between the nightmares I had as a child and that was coming back and what, what was happening to me in the daytime. And in my despair and, and uh, not having any answers to all my questions, I was this close of ending my life because I just couldn't deal with it. And as a last resource, I, I walked out one night, I walked out to the ocean and I was sitting there and I said, why is this happening to me? Why do I have my memories? What is, what can I do? And I got this strength inside me, this light really that came inside me and it just filled me with, with light. And I just knew that I will get answer to all my questions. If I just was strong and I didn't give up and I was just, just staying, staying alive most of all. And at that night when I came home, I went to sleep. I had a nightmare again. But the nightmare was the answer of all those questions. And it showed me what happened. And at that night, I realized that what happens to you in one lifetime affects you in this lifetime or in the next lifetime. It's not a coincidence when things happen to you. It always has a purpose. But even if we can't see the purpose, we have to believe in it and we have to be strong and we have to trust our inner spirit, our, our, the good force within ourselves and not let the evil forces take over. And in my dream, I could see that those two people that have persecuted, persecuted me in this life, they were in my past life. And there were things happened in my last days of life as Anna Frank that is not known, and I certainly didn't know about it, and that explained why it happened as it did in this lifetime. Because there was unfinished business, so to speak. And when I realized that, it gave me so much strength so I could stand up and say, well, last time you managed to kill me, this time you will not. This time I had the choice to stand up and say that I will not allow you to kill me. But in my past life, I didn't have that choice. And after that, I came to the conclusion that the reason why I've had these memories must have been, first, first of all, I wouldn't have survived this thing if I haven't had the memories, because then everything would have seemed totally meaningless and evil to me. And 
The second thing is that I wrote my book, and where I go out and I say that I was Anne Frank. And that is not the important message, but the important message is that if you know that you have had a life before, if you know that it could be things that happened to you in your past life, or it could be karma, it could be people around you that, that affected you in a way that they did at that time, this is the reason why it happens now. You don't have to remember your past life, but I think that you, it, it makes it easier for you if you know that you had one. And to me, it definitely saved my life to see the connection and to know that I was the one to make the choice in this life. And I think that we all have that, that possibility to make our own choices. And that is why I wrote this book. So if anyone that reads this book can see what I went through and say that then I can go through what I have to meet and face too, then it was worth it because I knew that a lot of people would react negatively for me coming out saying who I was. But I couldn't, I couldn't make up another name or say that I was another person in order to write my book. I had to tell the whole truth. And that is what I'm here to do. And I'm very happy that you wanted to listen to me. And thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, so does anybody have any questions? Hello. Um, I wanted to know, have you, have you been able to get rid of any anxieties from that past life? Yes, I, I actually, after this last dream I had and when everything uh, became clear to me, it was like taking away a, a shade in front of my eyes. It was really, I came to total peace with my memories and with, with my life in general too. And that's also a part of why I moved to America actually. I moved here five years ago and that was like a new start of my life because I got rid of the whole backpack I had carried with me for all those years. So no more anxiety now. And, and have you found, found out other past lives other than Anne Frank's? No, I haven't. I have never really looked into that because I have been asked many times if I want to do a regression. And I am so afraid of going back into that life again. So I really, I really don't want to. And and I had more than enough of memories that I wanted. So I really don't want to open that door again. Thank you. Um, now that you've grown up to be a, a woman and you know that in that life you were a young girl who didn't survive past her adolescence, how does that, those thoughts to you of what you had been compared to how far you've progressed now? Well, that is a very difficult question <laughs> because, uh, like I said, my memories faded away when I was about 15. And I think that is about the same age where I, where I left my life. And I didn't have any memories after that until these difficult times came up. And of course, it has sometimes struck my mind that if I hadn't died in my past life, I would have been about 80 years old now. And, you know, that's kind of a weird, weird feeling. But other than that, I just can't really relate to, uh, to, to what you're saying there, that being an adult woman now and a child at that time. Well, I mean, the idea is that um, that child that you previously know you have experienced didn't get to experience being an adult woman, and now you get to carry that with you. Do you feel that there's a continuance there? Or I, yes, in a, in a way it is because I, I, I know that I wanted to write books. I know that I wanted to be famous, you know, and I'm not famous, but I have written my books and I have pursued that and I have uh, 
got my, my message out to a lot of people about what's important in life and that you have to believe in the good forces. And that, is, that was very important to me as Anna Frank, and uh, I have been able to... to yeah, I have been. Were you able to meet any of Annie Frank's relatives or friends? And if you did, how did they react to you? Yes, as a matter of fact, I was introduced to uh, Anna Frank's uh, last living relative uh, that is her cousin and that lives in Switzerland. And I was introduced to him about six, seven years, six years ago by my publisher in Switzerland. And uh, this uh, Buddy Elias is a name, the cousin of Anna Frank, and he had heard about uh, me having memories as Anna Frank because my publisher knew about it, even though I, I didn't write about it, but he knew about it. So he had told Buddy Elias this, and Buddy said that he wants to meet me, uh, even though he didn't believe in reincarnation. And uh, I think that he was curious just to see what, what person would go around and claim that she had been on a crank. So my publisher told me when I was there uh, for a book signing, they said that there's a famous uh, actor, which Buddy Elias is actually a famous actor, uh, that wants to meet you because he has read your books. So my publisher didn't tell me who he was. Uh, so we were invited there for dinner, and we went there, and uh, I, I knocked the door, and Buddy opened, and at the same moment, we just fell in each other's arms. He was crying, and I was crying, and uh, we just sat alone for two hours, and we just talked and talked and talked. And uh, Buddy is the president of the Anna Franks Foundation, which is a very powerful foundation with a lot of money. And uh, as a president of the foundation, he's in a very vulnerable situation, of course. So when he went out uh, to newspapers, when they asked him uh, about me, and he went out there and he said that I really believe that she was Anna Frank. If anyone was Anna Frank, it's Barbara. It was after my book was published. So he came right into the hot fire there. And when I wrote my book, I also sent the manuscript to Buddy first. And I said, it's you to read this book, and it's you to decide if it's going to be published or not. And he read it, and he sent it back to me. And he said that it's your story, and it has to be published. So without him, it wouldn't have been. But when he went out and, and uh, said that he really you know, supported me and my book and everything, he was almost killed. I mean, they went after him like crazy. And they wrote big articles about him, how the president of the Anna Franks Foundation could be so crazy and believe in such stupid things. And where would this lead eventually with the royalties and, you know, all these stupid things. So, and he's an older man. I mean, he's 75 years old. And he got so affected by this, he almost had a heart attack. And he was really, really uh, in bad condition for a while. And... Uh, I just said to him and his wife, too, that, you know, you just can't do this. You have to back off here and just don't make any statements. And he said, that that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to talk about it anymore. So he, he has been, of course, questioned a lot to, to go out and, and talk about it, but he just doesn't do anything anymore with it. But we are very, very close friends. And every time I go to Switzerland, I stay with, stay with Buddy and his wife. And we have weekly contact, more or less. Mm 